Welcome again, everybody, for week two of the Good Bugs uh, Gardening Series with Dr. Barb Abraham. She is a professor at uh, Christopher Newport uh, University, and she is also a Hampton Extension Master Gardener. And this week, we'll be learning about predators and parasitoids. So, Dr. Abraham, I will give uh, the presentation to you. Thank you, Galen. Hello, everybody. I'm going to get right started because this uh, this presentation may be a little long. So if I go too fast, jot down your questions and hopefully we'll have some time at the end. I'm going to talk briefly about IPM. And I did it when I made this up. I made it up from all kinds of sources, but I didn't have the Hampton document in front of me. So if I say anything that contradicts um, your official documents, if you're a master gardener, please go with the official documents. This is kind of my take on IPM. And then we'll talk about natural enemies, specifically the predators and parasitoids. Okay, so what is integrated pest management? It's a long-term strategy, so it's not a one and done sort of thing. And it also uses a combination of different ways of controlling pests, potentially lower costs and definitely minimal effect on the environment. You can use IPM for all different kinds of pests. Today, we're of course going to be specifying insects. The goal of IPM as opposed to more traditional pest management is to reduce adverse impacts, mainly those from pesticides. Um, and you have to, when you're thinking of the environment, you also have to think of non-target organisms, which could include pollinators, it could include birds or other wildlife, it could include pets or children. Um, IPM is based on research, Okay, so these are the steps according to Barb Abraham. You obviously need to keep up with your garden. You need to inspect your plants on a regular basis. You need to know what your plants are, what your environment is like in terms of shade, soil, etc. And you also have to know what the beneficials in your gardens are. And so that's the purpose of today. And of course, you have to know what pest you're dealing with. And of course, there's help for you through the extension office, as well as other master gardeners, if, you, um, if you're not familiar with these guys. I'm not going to deal with the pests. There are too many of them. <laughs> okay, so I think step three is very important, because you have to figure out what you are willing to to admit into your garden. Does seeing one uh, Japanese beetle throw you into a tizzy, or do you have to really see some damage on your roses or whatever before you wanna do anything? So you have to set your specific tolerances, whether they're aesthetic or economic, if you're you know, raising vegetables to sell at the farmer's market or something like that. Uh, but that's a very important step because people who can't tolerate one, one bug are, are going to have really bad effects on the environment from spraying pesticides, if that's what they do. So then after you know all of the above, then you figure out what it is that you're going to do. And the integrated part of integrated pest management means that you're using different kinds of tactics, which we'll talk about in a minute. And these are things that you need to take into account in your own garden or yard. Economics, you know, how expensive is what you want to do? Feasibility, can you do it? Effectiveness, once you've done it, is it really helping? And toxicity in terms of both the pest and the non-target organisms. And then number five is the continuing part of it. Uh, you have to look at your garden after you've applied your strategies and see what it did. What was the outcome? And do you need to change it for next year or did you have a great outcome? Okay, so what are the tactics for the IPM strategy? And 
Uh, this first one about choosing plants, I know I've heard Galen and Carol King and lots of other people say, right plant, right place. So basically, that's the first thing. You, you don't want to plant sun plants in the shade or vice versa. The pests aren't what's going to take them out, although they may contribute to it. In a large agricultural setting or a fairly large garden, you want to do things like rotating your legumes, which put nitrogen back into the soil, with things like corn that suck the, uh, the nitrogen out of the soil. Time the planting dates as best you can. Of course, the weather is the primary thing, but sometimes you can figure out when a pest is going to be at its peak and avoid that time for your little seedlings. Overgrown vegetation in my yard, that's English ivy that I don't seem to be able to get rid of. And pests can certainly hide off of your garden plants in other vegetation in your yard. Now this companion planting most people have heard of, it's called intercropping in farms because it's usually done in rows. I hadn't, before I made this presentation, I actually hadn't heard of this three sisters method because I'm a flower garden, not a gardener, not a vegetable gardener, but evidently corn, pole beans and squash planted together uh, mutually help each other. And of course the pole beans are legumes. And so they're putting nitrogen into the soil I was aware of beans and corn, but I don't know where the squash comes in. Trap crops is a different kind of um, strategy. Trap crops are things, or trap garden plants, things that pests prefer over what you don't want them to eat. So for Japanese beetles, you can plant soybean zinnias or white roses to keep them off of you know, unless it's white roses that you're trying to keep them off of. <laughs> but anyway, the idea is it's you're planting something that they prefer to what you don't want them to eat. The second kind of tactic to use once you get past, you know, when you're going to plant, what you're going to plant, where you're going to plant it, is mechanical and physical, which a lot of people don't really think about unless you've been doing this for a while. So you can kill the pests directly, you can block them out, or you can make the environment unsuitable for them. Part of that would be removing weeds that they like to sit in. So you can use pheromone traps. Pheromone traps are frequently used for uh, male moths. They, the pheromone is the chemical that the female moth emits to attract the male for mating. And they will come to these pheromone traps in large numbers and you can really significantly reduce the next generation of moths by, uh, by trapping all the males and then the females don't get impregnated. Sticky traps, tanglefoot is a barrier that is used around trees. So it's not only sticky and that's how it keeps things from climbing up the trees like cicadas or whatever, anything that pupates in the ground and then is gonna wanna eat the leaves on the tree or like the cicadas, lay their eggs uh, in the tree. Pers my personal favorite is hand picking pests off. Somebody asked me the other day how to get rid of aphids on their milkweeds. And I said, I run my fingers up and down the stem. That pretty much kills them. If, you, if you're afraid to do that or you don't like getting your hands dirty, you can put gloves on to do that. For Japanese beetles, a good way is pick them off, put them in a bucket of water with some soap, which uh, basically gums up their spiracles even uh, before they drown and they can't get back out because of that layer of oil on the surface. So these are, these are two different kinds of tactics before you even think about chemicals. Here's another one, and that's what we're gonna focus on today. So biological control uses natural enemies in the garden or the farm. Agriculture makes extensive use of IPM in terms of the second one here, parasitoids. And I'm gonna talk about paras parasites versus parasitoids. Y'all are aware that there are praying mantises, ladybugs, and other things that will eat pests in your garden. Unfortunately, most of them are pretty nonspecific. So if you have a large infestation of one particular kind of insect, a parasitoid might be the best way to uh, control it because they're usually more specific than predators. 
and there are exceptions to every rule. Now, pathogens, um, example, milky spore is very specific for Japanese beetle grubs. So there are lots of pathogens that are used also in agriculture. I'm not as familiar with those and we're not gonna be talking about them really. Competitors you don't want in your garden because although they may decrease the abundance of one kind of pest, they might, if they're really competing with it, they're also going to be eating your plants. So that is not a very good uh, way to use IPM in the garden. Okay, so last and last and least, as I like to say, and, and by the way, I'm really over the top. I'm a never pesticides person. So this is the part that you really have to go back to the book if you have the Master Gardening Handbook and the Pest Control Manual. Um, in IPM, you can use pesticides, but it's the last thing to look at if all else fails. And usually, because IPM is an integrated strategy, you use more than one approach. I, I do want to point out, many people misuse the term pesticide. Pesticide is a very broad term, and it includes insecticides which kill insects, fungicides which kill fungi, et cetera, et cetera, rodenticides. Um, most insecticides are broad spectrum, which means they're going to kill all the insects. They're going to kill the pollinators, the predators, the parasitoids, as well as the pests. Uh, the way that most of them do that is acting upon insect nervous systems. And that is because insect nervous systems do have some um, trans neurotransmitters that are similar to those of other animals. Uh, this is where you can get into toxicity with other animals. The one that I want to particularly focus on, because I don't have time to talk about all the pesticides, is the neonics. Uh, I belong to Friends of the Earth, and they send out literature saying that if a chickadee eats one seed that's been coated with a neonic, it will die. And certainly the neonics are uh, toxic to pollinators and predators as well as pests. If you're not familiar with these neonics, basically they, they use them to treat seeds, but they, it soaks in. So when the seed germinates, the neonic is still in the, in the growing plant and eventually in the nectar and pollen, and that's why it's so bad for the pollinators. There are uh, other kinds of chemicals that perhaps don't go in this category. Um, I just, in the Daily Press today, saw an article about California. They finally got some rain last winter and now they have a good mosquito crop. And so they're starting to use drones to spread. Uh, they did not specifically say BT, but they said bacteria that kill the larvae of the mosquito. And that is BT or Bacillus thuringiensis. Israelensis is the, the kind of BT that kills mosquito larvae. I, I put relatively specific because evidently it, it also will kill the larvae of other kinds of flies. But as far as I know, it does not go beyond the insects. It does not harm, um, it does not harm aquatic crustaceans or fish or any other kind of aquatic life. Like the BT for mosquitoes is for the larvae specifically because they filter feed and they, they actually eat it and then it, it kills them that way. Another chemical that's more specific than the, the uh, organic uh, pesticides, insecticides, are the IGRs. And what they do is they mimic the insect juvenile hormone, which keeps a growing larva from molting into a pupa. So if a caterpillar eats an insect growth regulator, it just becomes a bigger and bigger and bigger caterpillar until its physiology can't support it, and so it dies. And so if it never pupates, you never get an adult, and so you never get the next generation. So these are two things that are used uh, a lot in IPM and could be used in your garden, I believe. You're looking for what, Mary? Uh, the okay. salad. Third, third shelf. Bottom. Third shelf down. Okay, somebody isn't. Salad. Somebody isn't. Peg, there you go. 
Okay, hello, just to remind everybody um, to please okay. mute your microphone. So let's talk about the natural enemies that are used in biological control, focusing on the garden because most of these would not be used in, uh, in agriculture in large scale growing. So we've talked about most of these already individually. We haven't and won't really talk about vertebrates, but of course you know that um, birds are great at uh, controlling insects. Some of the ones that catch the mosquitoes on the wing are great and all, almost all songbirds feed insects to their young. So they, in the spring, continuing now, they are feeding a lot of insects, but we're not gonna talk about them any longer. One comment on spiders that I'll make here while you're looking at the list, in rice paddies in Japan, I've actually read a peer reviewed paper on how they will construct little straw houses for spiders to live in because it actually, that's their method of IPM in rice paddies, one of their tactics anyway. And we don't do that here. Spiders are pretty nonspecific predators, but they do eat a lot of insects. And we'll talk about all of these guys. I'll show you more pictures in some of them with prey. Uh, some of these are not used in agricultural IPM in the US anyway. So according to Richard Hoffman, who was, before his passing, Mr. Invertebrate for Virginia, there are 56 species of centipedes in Virginia. And of course, the house centipede here you won't find in your garden, but you might find some of these others. And they are all predators. And some of them can be fairly large, although not, uh, not gigantic. Uh, so they eat a lot of insects in the garden. We've talked about predatory mites. Now, the, the kicker here is that chigger mites are red. Some of these guys are red. Velvet mites are red. So not every red mite that you see is going to be a predator, but it's also not going to be a chigger mite. Um, but as you can see, they do feed on other mites as well as some other uh, small insects. They are very small, and they are often used in IPM because there are so many of them, you can grow them pretty easily, et cetera. Pseudoscorpions we talked about before, I showed you that these are about the size of your fingernail or smaller. This one has a spring tail. There's his tail is sprung here. Daddy long legs, I think that's a leaf hopper. And leaf hoppers can be pests in some crops. I don't know how important they are on flowers, but certainly on vegetables. Remember, they're not spiders, as you can clearly see from uh, the shape of the body, the segmentation here, but they are mostly predators and scavengers. Uh, according to sources that I have read, sometimes they may feed on plant juices, uh, but they, they don't cause a lot of damage. So they're on the whole, they're definitely uh, beneficial in your garden. Now, around my yard, I, I still find them, but I think that they're more common in the woods. So if you live near a woods, if you garden near the woods, you may have more of these than those of us who don't. I'm going to go in a little bit more detail on spiders because they are one of my absolute favorite invertebrates. I studied them for over 30 years. It's a very large group. There are uh, almost 51,000 species today. Tomorrow there may be more or less depending on the systematists. Uh, so they're the seventh, seventh largest taxon of animals after the five largest insect orders that I'll show you in a bit. And the acari, which includes the mites and the ticks, they're also, especially mites, are a very large group. How many spiders are in your garden? Remember, this is a good thing, okay? Um, depending on the structure of your garden, if you have a lot of different heights and configurations, uh, you're going to have a large number. People who, who have a yard that has just grass and trees aren't going to have nearly as many spiders as people who have garden plants and shrubs as well as grass and trees. So the number of layers counts, the structural complexity counts, but they can get up to 
an extremely large number. I don't think you're going to have 842 per yard, uh, per square yard in your garden, but you could have way more than 5.4 if you were carefully looking. Okay, now spider webs. I want to point out right now that not all spiders make webs. When they all spiders spin silk, they use them to wrap their eggs. They use them as drag lines. If they fall off of or jump off of something, they can climb back up the line. They use them for ballooning when they're dispersing as babies. And they make all kinds, different kinds of webs. This is our typical orb web that you'll see in a minute with the garden orb web spider. This is a long jawed orb web weaver web, which is at a slant or even horizontal. And then these are all cobwebs with different uh, configurations. So lots of different kinds of webs and not all spiders make webs, but they do all eat insects as well as each other and anything else small enough for them to get. This is something that I found that I would show you. Um, it, it's not really very comprehensive at all. Most of these spiders are either orb weavers. All of these are orb weavers. That's an orb weaver. Um, fishing spiders, I didn't bring a separate picture. They are about the biggest spiders that we have in terms of leg span. Uh, you can see them on the surface of the water or hanging head down on a piling. And they're called fishing spiders because they will actually eat minnows. Um, they look a lot like wolf spiders. Uh, jumping spiders, this green one is pretty common here. The bold jumper, Phytopus audax, is pretty common here. And then we've got a couple more um, orb weavers down here. So this is not nearly all the families or species of spiders in Virginia. Uh, this one is usually called a black and yellow. I don't know why it's called just the yellow garden spider here, but everybody has seen these in the fall. They make a very large orb web and the spider, the female spider itself is very large, the male not so large. And there it is. Okay, Argiope arantia, the black and yellow garden spider. Some people call this the writing spider because this stable momentum in the middle of the web. Not all spider webs have this. It reflects ultraviolet light, it strengthens the web, and it's believed to be, one of its functions is believed to be to make the web more visible to birds because any fairly large bird, chickadee size or larger, flying into almost any spider web is gonna destroy it. Now there are spiders, there's one related to this one, the golden silk spider. It's not found in Virginia, but it's found almost as far north as Virginia. If you've ever been in Georgia uh, or points just north or south, the Carolinas, they make a web that goes from the street lights to the trees and they have a huge web and their web is very strong and they can actually catch cicadas. They can actually catch hummingbirds in their web. But most of our spiders in Virginia can't, can't catch a bird. The bird would instead tear up the web and that wouldn't benefit the spider. Here are some more Virginia orb web weavers. This is the marbled orb web weaver. I've seen these in the Dismal Swamp, but they're pretty much everywhere. Um, this one is a long jawed orb web weaver, although it doesn't have long jaws. It was moved from the Araneidae to the Tetragnathidae. Uh, but you, if you see a greenish spider in a web with the orange spots, it's probably this one. Here's one of the spiny orb weavers. And these guys are uh, not only striking because of their spines, but because of their coloration. This one is called a barn spider. This is the top, this is the bottom. This is typical of this Neoscona genus that it has these spots on the bottom. Remember, all predators of your garden pests. Okay, cobweb weavers. I, I put this in to show you some of the more outstanding looking ones. These are not all in Virginia, but this is the American house spider. This is a pregnant female with two egg sacs in the web. Notice how big and fat her abdomen looks. This one clearly not pregnant, probably not even mature because the male is as big as she is. The females are brown, the, the males are more reddish, and notice the longer legs. 
that if she were mature, she would be a bit, her body would be a bit bigger than his, although his legs are always more long. This is one of the few species of spiders that allows the male to remain in the web without being eaten. Okay, crab spiders do not make webs. I think the most amazing thing about them is that they can change color to match the plant that they're on. So I think both of these are goldenrod spiders, um, although there are a uh, several, two or three other genera of crab spiders, Masumina, Masuminops, Masuminoides, um, that are yellow like this. They're called crab spiders because of the way they hold their big front two pairs of legs. And of course they have two more pairs, they're spiders that are much smaller. But again, you can see the, the front two pairs here are much larger and here. This is a Zysticus crab spider. He's got an ant and he would be camouflaged down in the leaf litter uh, or mulch in your garden. I don't think you'll see as many of these, but you're very likely to see these yellow crab spiders or goldenrod crab spiders in your gardens. And yes, if they're sitting on flowers, they may take a pollinator or two, but if there's pests there, you want them. Jumping spiders, very large group, uh, very good eyesight as opposed to most spiders. You can move your finger in front of their faces and they will turn and track your finger. This one is commonly, this is the male, this is the female of the same species, Phytopus audax, the audacious jumping spider. This is pretty big guy. This is about the biggest salticid or jumping spider that we have in Virginia. They tend to come in houses in the winter looking for warmth and just put them right back out. Please don't squash. These uh, photos are not to scale. This zebra spider is very tiny. Okay, so he is not even half the size of these. And this is the green jumper. Again, this one is pretty common in Virginia. This one I've seen um, down in Southern Virginia, but my guess is I just didn't look enough for it. And this one is definitely here. Okay, wolf spiders. They come in all sizes. Some of them run on top of the water. Uh, the ones that run on top of the water have a tuning fork like Mark on the front and they're very uh, small. But one way to tell for sure that you're looking at a wolf spider is if it has an egg sac attached to the spinnerets. Now those fishing spiders make an egg sac like this, but they hold it under the body with a pair of legs. Whereas the wolf spiders uh, drag it around with them attached to their spinnerets. And when the babies hatch out, they ride on the abdomen of the female until they're ready to disperse. So if you ever accidentally touched a spider, a wolf spider with the tip of your shoe, they go in all directions. Okay, enough with my favorite group. The insects, of course, are a huge group. They, they are more than all other animals on earth combined. The four largest orders, everybody agrees with Coleoptera, the beetles. Flies is a very large group. Moths and butterflies are a very large group. And the wasps, which also contain bees and ants in order Hymenoptera. The reason that I uh, called them what I did was that Hoffman says probably in these groups, only about half of the species are recorded. And this is typical of invertebrates. They're not as well studied as birds and mammals. And so we know less about them. Certain groups have been pretty well studied. Certainly the butterflies, the life cycles are pretty well known. The host plants are known. The distributions are known. Um, and, and honeybees, which are like cattle in, in the bee world, they're pretty well known. But the other bees are not. When I, when I did some research in Western Virginia, I got county records for several. One of my students got a county record for one of the bees that he captured. So keeping in mind um, that these are not as well known as some other animals. Now, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this slide. What I wanted to do was to be fairly comprehensive about the kinds of insects that are predators and therefore natural enemies of the pest 
insects in your garden. And I wanted to tell you which groups were all predators. I've already told you all spiders are predators, for example. Actually, most arachnids, uh, excluding the mites, are predators, uh, ticks, if you want to call them pr blood predators or parasites. But uh, you all aware that you can buy praying mantids to put in your garden. All praying mantids are predators, although not all are native. I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, now, bugs. The title of this series is Good Garden Bugs. Um, all bugs are insects. So the spiders and the centipedes, et cetera, are not bugs. But not all insects are bugs. You know, most people use it to mean insect. Only this order, whether you call it Hemiptera or Heteroptera, uh, are called by entomologists true bugs. So these are the real bugs. And some of them are plant pests. Some of them will feed on your plants. Some of them will feed on each other. The same is true of beetles. There are simply so many beetles that some of them do everything. You know, some of them are scavengers, some of them live in soil, some are big pests like the Japanese beetle, and some are really good predators in the garden or in even an agricultural setting. Order Neuroptera, uh, we're going to talk about a couple of different kinds of them, and I believe that all the Neurops, but certainly all of what I have listed here, are predators. Flies, you know that mosquitoes uh, are not good guys. Uh, but there are some, and I've only, when it, when you see et cetera, that means I have not tried to be comprehensive because the slide was already too big. Uh, so a lot of flies are pests of one kind or another, and a lot of them are predators of those pests, and some of them are parasitoids as well. Uh, wasps, likewise, nobody wants to get stung, uh, but some of them are important predators of garden insects. Uh, bees, remember, bees eat nothing but nectar and pollen, so bees are never predators or herbivores uh, in terms of eating your plants. They certainly suck the nectar, they eat a little pollen, but they carry the pollen around, which negates how much they eat. And then some ants are good guys, and some uh, not so much. Okay, Odinata, dragonflies and damselflies. The way to tell them apart, these guys are usually bigger, the dragonflies, and they hold their wings out straight at rest. The damselflies are usually smaller, although they're, and they're certainly more delicate, although there are some fairly large damselflies, but they fold their wings at rest. Notice the, I'm gonna contrast this with something in a minute. Notice the little tiny, you can't even see on these dragonflies, little tiny bristle-like antennae. All predators. Mantids. Now, most of the mantids that you see may be this Chinese mantid. And keep in mind that the color from brown to green can vary in any of these. But the Chinese mantids are the really big ones that you see. And this is what their egg sac or oothika looks like, egg case. Our native one is down here, and some of them are green as well. They usually have short wings, especially in the female. The wings do not go to the end of the abdomen, even as an adult. And the egg uh, cases look like this. And th these can have hundreds of um, baby mantids coming out of them uh, when they hatch. And if you see holes in them that didn't look, that are very round, I can't tell if any of these have them, but those would be parasitoids of the um, mantid eggs or larvae. If you see a mantid with these white spots on its legs, that's the European mantis. Uh, I looked online, I don't think I saw any of these for sale, but, but I definitely saw the Chinese one. So you can get mantas, of course, from Amazon. You can get anything from Amazon. But please, if you're going to buy them to release in your garden, buy the native species. That's the Carolina mantis. Okay, the predaceous bugs. I've only included two families. These four are the assassin bugs. And these four are the ambush bugs. Um, 
And these guys, I believe, can also change colors to match what they're sitting on. Can you see the, the bug here? And this is a fly that it has got. Uh, so they, predaceous insects, as well as spiders, are pretty effective at eating things that are even larger than they are. Raptorial front legs like a praying mantis uh, tells you that that's a predator. Uh, bugs all have this, what's called a beak for piercing and sucking things. Some of the homopterans that are closely related to these, which are all plant pests, like the cicadas, uh, also have a beak for sucking juice. So the kind of damage that a, a hemipterin or homopterin would make in a plant would not be taken off the edge of the leaf or stripping the epidermis or anything. It would be uh, sucking the juice. And so you may get holes or brown spots that would be due to these guys. But the, this is the infamous wheel bug. Evidently, I've never been bitten by one, but evidently these guys uh, bite really hurts. They probably have a little bit of venom, although you will not die from it unless you have some kind of weird allergy. Coleoptera. Some of the tiger beetles, which are these two, are endangered, uh, partly because of collection, probably more because of habitat loss. But these guys are so cool. If you're ever on a dry path in the woods somewhere and you see something fly up, land again in front of you, and then run on long legs, and then fly up as you get closer, that's a tiger beetle. They're great predators. And the ground beetles, the carabids, this is a huge group, lots and lots of species, including the bombardier beetle, the false bombardier beetle. Don't put your nose close to these because they can actually shoot out of the rectum um, boiling gases, and that's their defense mechanism. But um, the false bombardier beetles can't do that. Here's this guy's eating a slug, so you, you know you want that one in the garden. Oh, let me go back one second. Big jaws again. If you see big jaws, you're pretty sure you can't really see very well on the tigers, but big jaws means a predator. Okay, ladybird beetles. What you may not have been aware of was how many different kinds of ladybird beetles there are. Here's the life cycle. This is what the eggs look like. Small larva, big larva, larva starting to pupate, mature pupa. And then this is a newly hatched one that hasn't um, gotten its coloration yet. And there's the adult. Frequently, these guys are named by how many spots they have. This one is the nine spotted lady beetle, which is in decline, partly due to the Asian lady beetle. A lot of foreign uh, or non-native lady beetles, ladybird beetles, ladybugs, whatever you want to call them, a lot of them have been released for agriculture. And some of them are out competing the native species. So again, if you're going to buy ladybugs to release in your garden, please make sure that you're getting a native species. There are lots of native species. Rove beetles, we'll talk about them again when we talk about soil because they're found in the leaf litter and soil. Big jaws means the larval stage as well as the adults are predators. Notice that the, the wing covers, unlike most beetles, are short. In most beetles, like the lady beetles here, the wings completely cover the body. But in the row beetles, they're very short. When they want to fly, they just hold those out to the side and these beautiful big uh, second pair of wings comes out from behind them, unfolds, and they're quite large. Again, this guy's eating a slug. Okay, Neuroptera, green and brown lace wings. I had a lot of these at my lights at night um, around my house, and you can see that they're eating uh, aphids. The, the hollow shells are the white ones, and the brown ones are the ones that haven't been eaten yet. Here is the larva again, look at the huge jaws. Okay, these also, I believe, eat mites as well as aphids, but they're best known for eating aphids. The brown lacewings are not as common, but they do eat aphids. This one is doing its thing, and the larva looks a bit different. Um, but again, 
it has big jaws and it eats aphids as a larva as well. Everybody's probably heard of doodle bugs. Here is one of the pits of the doodle bug. There's the doodle big bug out of the pit, big jaws. They sit at the bottom of their pit with those jaws open and when an ant falls in, goodbye ant. Um, the adults look very much like damselflies, except look at the difference in the antennae. So if you get what looks like a damselfly, but has long antennae, you know that it's an ant lion. And again, a good predators. Some flies. Now we, we will talk about these guys again next time because they're really great pollinators in the adult stage. But guess what the larvae eat? Okay, I love this one because it shows what it's eaten right through the skin because these are purple uh, aphids. So um, again, the life stages of something with complete metamorphosis, meaning egg, larva, pupa, adult, uh, can be doing two different things in your garden. Robber flies. Um, I'm not quite sure whether that is a yellow jacket or what that is. It is more than likely Australian. Uh, this one here, I believe, is a common one in Virginia. And I think that's a taban. And I think that's a horse fly from those huge eyes. And again, this guy's got a Japanese beetle. And this one is a bumblebee mimic. There are lots of flies that mimic bees of various kinds. And of course, that is beneficial to them uh, because birds probably don't go after bees as often as they go up, uh, after other insects if they've been stung once. Okay, so let's, let's look at the hymenoptera, the bees, wasps, and ants, um, which are pollinators, predators, and parasitoids. Not each species is not all three of these. Uh, but a lot of the um, wasps that we don't like because they can sting are predators. Some people call these parasites um, because they sting a, a spider or a, a caterpillar or other insect, a large one. They take it down to a hole underground and then they lay an egg on it. The egg hatches and it eats the paralyzed insect, which remains alive until the until enough of it's consumed that it dies. And the thread-waisted wasps are solitary, meaning that the females make their own nest. They don't interact with other uh, ones. Yellow jackets, hornets, paper wasps, et cetera, et cetera. Some of them are evidently solitary, although the better known ones are social, and I'll show you some of those in a minute. They progressively provision the larvae. So they keep feeding the larvae like honeybees do. Ants are all social. Many are omnivores, meaning they feed on plant and animal material. They're beneficial in soil, so we'll be talking about them again then. Okay, so here are the sphesid, um, sphesid wasps. You've probably seen this one. This one is called a cicada killer. Again, this is not a social species, but they tend to nest in the ground in aggregates. I used to have a colony, I shouldn't call it a colony, an aggregation of them outside. When I, when I was a student in Iowa, I lived in the back part of a lady's house and rented it. And I only had one door and these guys were right outside the door. But I very quickly found that I could walk right past them and they wouldn't pay any attention to me even when they were coming and going. Very strong things can drag cicadas around and, and lay eggs on them. Here's another thread-waisted wasp or sphesid wasp with a caterpillar. Here's one at a flower. So these guys are also pollinators. This one is a sand wasp. These can be very common on basketball, uh, excuse me, baseball diamonds in Virginia. Okay, if you look at the maps, you'll see that we are so lucky that we have all of these Okay, so we have the Eastern Yellow Jacket as well as the Southern Yellow Jacket. We have the European Hornet. This is not the giant Asian Hornet. Um, and we have the Bald-Faced Hornet. So these guys are all social. They live in various kinds of colonies and I, I have no time to talk more about them other than the fact that they're gonna feed their babies. Um, 
They are going to feed their babies insects. Honeybees versus yellow jackets. In spite of the fact that this one is a, a drawing rather than a photo, I think it's pretty clear if you're looking at them carefully, you can tell them apart easily. Compared to a yellow jacket, uh, honeybees look brown. Okay, compared to a yellow jacket, honeybees are fuzzy. Well, they're fuzzy no matter. And, and yellow jackets look totally hairless. They're not totally hairless, but at any rate, if it's getting in your hamburger at your picnic, it is not a honeybee. Remember, they only are attracted to nectar and pollen. They're attracted to flowers. These guys, on the other hand, are predators. So they're good in the garden. However, we don't want them in the yard because if you run the lawnmower over them, you're going to have a problem. Ants versus termites. Again, if you look at them carefully, uh, this ant is killing a termite. You can tell them apart. Okay, the, the best way, wasp waste. Okay, straight body, almost like a daddy long legs. Antennae are bent or elbowed. Okay, the antennae, if you look up here at this top one, you can see it looks like a string of beads. That's called manila form. Now, you may not have been aware that there were such things as flying ants and flying termites. These are the reproductive stage that are produced at one time of the year. And the males and the females both are produced with wings. And then the wings are, are broken or bitten off for the new females to start a new colony. Termites are beneficial in nature because they help break down dead wood. You just don't want them around your house. I once had some termites in an old picnic table I bought at a garage sale. Okay. What is a parasitoid? Why do I not want to call it a parasite, even though some people do? Parasitoids are insect parasites of other insects. They're often used in IPM because they usually kill their host. Okay, true parasites, you can have plant parasites of plants. You can have all different kinds of invertebrate parasites of vertebrates or other invertebrates. Uh, true parasites, um, if you omit pathogens, which could also be considered parasites, seldom kill their hosts. Tapeworms, roundworms. I once was at a vet's office where they said that a kitten had died from having too many fleas, too much blood loss. Um, but that, that's unusual. So parasitoids always kill the other insects that they parasitize. And here are some of them. Ichneumonoid because there are several families in this group. One of them is Ichneumonidae. The Braconids are the ones that parasitize the, the hornworms. What happens with these, and this guy is after um, beetle larvae, actually is going to parasitize beetle larvae. This is one of the largest parasitoids or uh, Ichneumon wasps. But what they do is they lay an egg in or on another insect and it hatches out and eats the insides of the insect and then eventually comes out, wraps itself in silk. I think that's what's going on here, that these are the larvae just emerging from the caterpillar. And these guys have already emerged from the caterpillar, um, spun the silken cocoon and then pupated and then this one actually has trap doors that the adult wasp comes out of. So even though this is a really big caterpillar, the parasitoids are usually very small. This one about the size of an aphid, and these are even smaller. Another kind of parasitoid wasp are even tinier. And some of these guys are really amazing looking. Look at the back legs of this. Look at the beautiful colors. Uh, look at the length of those legs. And this one, we really want to have around, again, not the garden necessarily, but it is a parasitoid of cockroach egg cases. Look at the antennae on this one. So very tiny wasps. These guys can't sting people, uh, but they certainly sting a lot of insects in the garden. Here is a group of flies that are parasitoids. And what can I say about them? Some of them look like house flies but they have these stiff bristles, okay? Most of the tachinids have stiff bristles on the rear end. Here's an egg of a tachinid on the Japanese beetle. 
this, I'm not sure if this caterpillar was dissected to bring the larva out or if it burst out. Um, and then here's a pupa of a tachinid fly that has the larva emerged from this cricket. So again, they parasitize a number of different kinds of insects that you might not want to have in your garden. And was that it? I guess I made it. We have time for questions if you have.